My name is Scott Ward. I'm the Solutions Architect here at AWS, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, but certainly not the only person. Uh, I'm also joined today by Suna, Suda Sridhavasan of Doan 9 and Roman Gruber of Western Union. And today we have the webcams on, and we're trying to take a little bit uh, more of a discussion approach uh, to our webinar instead of just talking through a bunch of slides. Uh, we've got a few slides to kind of help cover and reiterate some points in some areas, but for the most part, it's going to be a lot of our face on the screen and us talking. So um, with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to Suda, who's actually going to be our moderator for our discussion today. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Sudash Srinivasan. I'm the Vice President of uh, Marketing and Alliances at Dome 9. Uh, we have an exciting topic today. So we're going to talk about how you can use the native security controls that are available within AWS to go and implement the security posture that you need for your organization. And we're going to look at how Western Union has actually done exactly that, used those native controls to deploy and manage their infrastructure on AWS and they're also using some third-party tools like Dome 9, so we're going to look at what Dome 9 provides that enhances that capability. So let's get started. So Scott, first I want to start off with a question to you. AWS has done a phenomenal job of getting enterprise customers comfortable with deploying their production workloads on the, on the cloud, right? And confidence in the security of the cloud platform is an all-time high. Right. So can you talk about how securing environments on AWS is different from data center security? Sure, sure. Uh, first thing I'd maybe just generally start out with is that, you know, when it comes to security on AWS, uh, your data, your, your security professionals that are part of your organization still have a, a lot of things that they can do. Their, their jobs aren't going away. There's still a lot for them to focus on. Uh, I think the key thing for for people to keep in mind uh, when it comes to security is that uh, on AWS it's different because it's shared. There's not a lot of the uh, top to bottom security responsibilities that you might find in, in a typical company because uh, a lot of the things that you might see people having to normally worry about securing maybe at the data center level uh, are not required anymore. So, so with that shared responsibility model, uh, if you look at this slide here, AWS takes care of the bottom portion, really the security of the cloud. And that, that applies to maybe a lot of the things you might have seen in a normal data center. We, we have responsibility for securing that, that global infrastructure. So that the physical locations where all the infrastructure that runs AWS around the world, where, where all that uh, infrastructure is actually stored and, and housed, uh, we own the security for that uh, through various methods that, that we employ. Uh, and we also own the responsibility for kind of those core foundational services that, that prop up a lot of the AWS platform and, and what our customers doing, things around compute and storage and, and database and, and networking. So uh, there's a lot of things that a, a company would have to do, maybe some people might call undifferentiated heavy lifting, uh, that they don't have to worry about when it comes to security anymore. And so your professionals that, that are very critical to your organization when it comes to security, get to focus um, kind of probably the things that are maybe more of a differentiator for you as a company. So that's that top portion where the customers are really responsible for their security in the cloud. You know, starts with, you know, any AWS security configurations they might do, uh, how they're going to encrypt their network, how they're going to uh, encrypt uh, traffic that's flowing around between their, uh, their infrastructure and their offices or, or their applications. Uh, they get full control of the operating systems for the virtual compute they're running, so customers get to decide how they're going to configure it and who they're going to allow to access it, uh, how they're going to harden the operating system, when they're going to patch it, any other network or firewall configuration they may put on it. Uh, any applications that a customer actually puts on AWS, they, they have full control of and full responsibility of, so they need to make sure they know who can access the application and what responsibilities they have. Uh, they're responsible for actually configuration, configuring access to the AWS account itself through identity and access management. Uh, and finally, at the top there, one of the most important things is the customer data. So customers own their data. Uh, when it's stored in AWS, they get to whatever region they put it in, that's the, where the data is going to stay unless they execute on something that's going to move it or they enable configuration that would say they'd like to move that data. <clears throat> and with that being said, customers get to determine which service that they're gonna store the data in, and they also are responsible for knowing who can access that data and how they're ultimately going to protect that data, you know, whether it be encrypting uh, or some other method to actually ensure that that data is secure. So uh, probably a lot of things I've hit on that, that maybe uh, sound familiar when you're talking about an on-premise type environment, but uh, it's a little bit more of a refocused effort. And one of the key things, since we're, we're, we're working with a partner today, is that customers can implement partner solutions that 
help them meet their security profile as part of that top of that shared responsibility model. That's, that's one of the really important things to call out is that customers can, can choose and bring the tools that they want to, to ultimately get and, and be where they want to be when it comes to security. That's a great point, and, and I love that name, shared responsibility model, because it implies that there is something that AWS takes responsibility for, and it's heartening to see that Gartner and all the big analyst firms have said that in many ways, AWS is more secure than any enterprise is going to be able to make their own data center. So the, below the line, AWS, there's enough confidence among customers that that portion is taken care of from a security perspective. I think it's important to understand how their, the customer's share of the responsibility changes and what they need to implement it. So great point, Scott. So let's cool. talk about the zero to one scenario, right? I'm just getting started. I'm an organization getting started on AWS, getting ready to put my first one or two workloads on the cloud. What should I be thinking about? What is a good approach to think about that security? Sure, sure. So, so there's lots of different approaches you might you might see customers take, and, and each customer is going to be a, a, a little bit different in, in how they do things. But, but one area that I can particularly call out is is what we call the cloud option framework, which is actually uh, a, more of a formalized structure that we've actually put together to help organizations, you know, or, or customers or, or enterprises plan how they're actually going to move to the cloud. Because there's not just picking up and moving the application of the technology. There's lots of other people that are actually impacted. Uh, mm -hmm. By making that decision, which which hopefully uh, Roman will help us uh, uh, kind of show firsthand, you know, it, there's people that are responsible for running the business, people who are responsible for the financial aspects uh, of running infrastructure and, and application, <clears throat> people who are responsible for, for compliance. They're far removed from the technology, but they're they're in, they have to make sure that that you know your applications are compliant. So we can try to help guide people on how that works. There's people who are just responsible for people. There's there's people whose job roles are going to change when it comes to, to moving to the cloud and, and helping we help them understand through this framework how their job roles might change and where they might need to be focusing on, on, on retraining people. You know, that's just the business side. And then you've got this whole side where, you know, as we, you know, we talk about a lot of the cloud is that technology. You know, there's a lot of cool things that, that change when it comes to technology. So helping those teams understand how they can better leverage the AWS platform, how that might change, how they might be able to uh, do things that they've never been able to do before. Uh, of course, you know how the security model works and, and areas where they could uh, enhance their security. Some companies actually look at moving to the cloud as an opportunity to change their security approach, uh, and so that you know we, we work with them through that. And then we talk about operations. You know, how do you actually uh, handle your operations on the cloud, and, and, and what are some of the different ways you can uh, you know, more efficiently uh, maybe automate or respond to events that, that are happening with your cloud? So, you. Know, there's, you know, this is a very high-level uh, starting approach, and as I said, each customer is a little bit different, but these are some of the things that we try and help guide uh, customers on when they're moving to the cloud. This is a great framework. It's, it, it covers all the different pillars that people should be thinking about when they're going to the cloud. Let's double down on security a little bit, since this is a security-focused uh, webinar. So when you're thinking about security, what are some good principles for setting up security in your public cloud environment? Sure, sure. So we, we, we have uh, this lots of different principles and a few that I wanted to, uh, to kind of maybe touch base on today are, are, are some of the design principles for, for a program we called up kind of security by design. And there's these are very generic bullet points that, that kind of help just get people thinking. It's not like a prescriptive you have to do it this way, but you know, some of the highlights here, you know, building security in every layer. So if if you're doing a multi stack uh, or multi-tier type architecture. Make sure that you've got security in every layer and that it's not just maybe at the very front and, and the back end's very free and open. You want to kind of make sure that you have all the security you need everywhere. Uh, designing for failures. So, you know, we talk about, you know, if something fails, all the other components should still continue to work and it, everything shouldn't be blocked by, by one failure. But and at the same time, when those failures happen, they should be able to heal uh, and, and bring themselves back up and, and those types of things. Uh, plan for breach is important, you know, Understanding, like if something happens, how are you going to be act, be able to actually react and, and respond to that, and, and actually practicing it, uh, I think is even more important. Not just writing it out, but actually knowing how you're going to do it. Um, you know, leveraging, you know, designing for costs. So there's actually ways that you can actually. Um, 
have architectures that are very highly available and efficient, but you can actually start building cost into your architectures as far as being able to measure cost per customer or cost per transaction uh, at some point, um, and, and really kind of looking at that infrastructure as code where you, know, you can actually just have scripts or, or automation that actually uh, create and configure and manage your infrastructure. Those can actually be checked into source control and, and audited uh, you know, from a security and just from a code viability perspective the same way as normal code that, that's running in your application. So, so lots of different things that you guys can kind of, that customers can kind of put up you know, and look at and evaluate themselves against as they're trying to figure out what's the right design for me and how am I going to do this in the cloud. Awesome. When I look at this, I see a lot of the core security principles that people apply in their data centers as well, just in terms of you know, things like having an audit trail, having enough logs, having enough evidence and audit so that you know what's going on and you can look back and say this is what happened. Uh, and of course, the key thing in the cloud in security as, as you know, similar to everything else is automate, 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 right? There's so much that is happening on in cloud environments and a lot of it is moving towards automated processes for deployment, automated processes for provisioning. And what you're saying is kind of apply that same concept to security as well. Eliminate the manual processes, make it consistent and repeatable. So yeah, yeah, point. humans can make mistakes and if you can automate that, then you can re eliminate the, the risk and the mistakes that can happen. Yeah, and the thing with security is, you know, all it takes is one mistake, right? I mean, it's not it's not about the 99 times you've done it correctly. It's the one time that uh, someone slips up and then the next thing you know that, you know, you have an exposed server, you have an exposed S3 bucket, people are going to try to attack it. So you have to be consistent and, you know, proper about how you do it. So Roman, let's yeah. switch gears. Can you tell a bit about yourself, your organization, and more importantly, your journey to AWS? So how did you and your team decide to go on AWS, what does that look like? Thank you, Suda. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am the head of the application security team at Western Union. And for those who don't know Western Union, they are a leader in global payment services with more than 500,000 agent locations worldwide in over 200 countries and territories. Um, we started our cloud journey about one and a half years ago. The, the first application we had up and running in AWS was a money transfer application website. Now, after this one and a half years, we do have about 500 assets in the cloud and the uh, number is growing as we have more and more projects where infrastructure and, and applications move to the cloud. From a workload perspective, one of the first tasks for the application security team was basically to understand what it, what it actually means moving an app to the cloud. This was completely new to us. And how do we design security around the app in the cloud? We started with uh, what I would call a very traditional approach and we searched on the AWS marketplace you know, for the same products, the same vendors we currently use on-prem, you know, we wanted to have the same firewall vendor, the same web application firewall vendor, IPS, and so on, with the idea, because we are familiar with that technology already on-prem, on -prem, we're going to use it in AWS, and we're good to go. Um, quickly, we realized uh, that in order to get most out of the cloud, we had to rethink our approach and be open for new technologies um, specific to the cloud, like security groups, key management in the cloud, cloud watch, cloud trail, and more. And in order to be able to, we needed that in order to be able to address these new concepts of infrastructure's code and serverless architecture. At the end of the day, what worked for us was a combination of both. AWS native tools like security groups, cloud watch, cloud trail, and third party tools that we already use on-prem to, to build strong security controls in the cloud. Awesome. And, and Robin, I think you brought up a very important point that I've seen a lot of organizations do, which is, you know, when you're coming from the data center, there is a tendency to want to take the tools that you used in the data center and bring it to the cloud with you. And, and that approach actually is pretty good because you can get started quickly, you're already comfortable, you're familiar with what you have. But as you said, you know, the cloud offers a new environment and the need to think about security differently, right? So you have to come up with new tools, new frameworks, that use a lot of the native capabilities that are provided by the cloud, like CloudTrail, CloudWatch, Flow Logs, right? And so you basically did went through that journey of thinking about security, you know, taking whatever tools you could bring, and we'll get into this in more detail, but whatever tools you could bring, and then then thinking about the cloud security in a, in a fresh way as well, using what AWS provides. So great, great uh, start. So what is your, your reasoning behind AWS, why did you decide to go on AWS, and why the public cloud? What was it about the public cloud versus something in your data center that attracted you? 
all the benefits we saw with AWS are basically on one hand side is scalability and cost, right? Because you, you trade fixed expenses um, for variable expenses. Um, we also had speed and ease of deployment um, because resources are only a click away as infrastructure is code. And um, obviously productivity and flexibility because you have on-demand resources at the speed of business. And the most important for us from an application security point of view, security and reliability. As Scott mentioned at, uh, at the beginning, you know, in particular the shared responsibility model where we basically share responsibility of security between us and, and AWS. Got it, got it. Now, can you give us uh, you know, a very high level at a glance view of what the approval process looked like to get on AWS? Sure. I mean, once once Western Union decided to move to the cloud, basically from an uh, um, application security point of view, we started developing a framework that defined the playground, playground and the security controls for our developers for cloud projects. By framework, I mean a framework included a list of, a, for example, a list of approved EMIs, which included our security controls. They are free to use. Um, use EMIs approved by us that include our AV. Um, the framework included controls for S3 buckets, how to harden it, uh, approved cloud permission templates, and cloud deployment guidelines. So the development teams knew as long that as long as they stay, stay within this framework, they're good to go. While we, from a security point of view, in the background, we monitor compliance with our framework to make sure that nobody gave public read access to their S3 bucket, for example, or implemented infrastructure in a region which has not been approved by us. And so this is where we started with the framework. And we have we showed we have been flexible, right? If somebody wanted to use technology in the cloud, which was not covered in the framework by that time, basically we analyzed that new technology and then we either approved it or denied it based on our own compliance requirements. And if it was approved, we updated the controls in the framework. So if somebody else wanted to use it, they looked at the framework and said, Oh, great, um, Couchbase is in there, this is how I use it, I'm good to go. So and with this approach of a framework. We were, able, we were able to quickly assess new cloud projects and assess the impact to risk and compliance so we didn't delay the business from launching new services to the cloud as long as they make sure they've stayed within that, in, within that framework. Got it. So you, it's not about fearing the cloud but knowing exactly what you're getting into, understanding all the risks and what you need to put in place to mitigate those risks before you get on the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So what right. is the internal training and process redesign like? Like, did you have to go and retrain the team? How did people get ramped up on AWS? So, I mean, from a security point of view, for my team, we realized that we have to adapt quickly to those new concepts. And, and we realized quickly that, you know, our development teams kind of were way ahead of us from, uh, from their knowledge um, how to use those new systems. As, you know, we have to adjust to new concepts like infrastructure as code um, yeah. and, and serverless services like Lambda. And with limited resources on the application security side, we, re we quickly realized that we have to go for automation and look for tools to help us with cloud security in order to keep up with the speed of deployment of new services. Um, from a training perspective, um, kind of we trained obviously the security team. Um, you know what what does it mean moving to the cloud? Um, we also trained our developers on our security framework. And what is very important, we, we stayed very close with our development teams in or, and, and sold our service, our security service as, as being a technology partner to help them through that journey. Um, but, you know, kind of, it is, it is, we're still ramping up on, on, on knowledge in the cloud for, for the teams. Got it. Robin, Sorry, Robin, go ahead. Yeah. Quick, quick question for you. I'm curious on, on your approach. Did you, because obviously you're still moving to the cloud, did you, uh, are you using, like, did you train the same security team so they're focusing on both, or did you have to kind of create a cloud separate security team, or what kind of approach uh, did you take there? Um, well, we started with kind of training the same people that are in charge of on-prem application security, but quickly realized that we, you know, we need people focusing completely on cloud security, so we formed kind of what I would call a virtual cloud security team. Um, that under, that is part of the overall cloud architecture group. Okay, cool. Got it. And you mentioned that the security team is in some ways embedded into your development organization, right? You're bringing security thinking and security kind of the, the principles into the development process further upstream. I think we are seeing that across the board. There was a, a recent uh, state of DevOps report that I read 
that talked about that essentially. Right? The, the, the earlier that you can bring security into the process, the less expensive it is going to be for you to fix those security vulnerabilities when you find them. Right, and so what you're talking yeah. about is yeah. essentially that: how do you bring security, both from an organizational perspective and processes, back upstream? Right. So, what are some of the uh, security tools that AWS provides, tools and services that you use today? So, we use security groups. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to firewalls, we use CloudTrail and CloudWatch for logging and auditing. Um, we have the web up and running to protect websites against uh, malicious activity. And you know, where it fits our requirement to use KMS for key management. We, we, our approach is we try to stay as close as possible to native AWS tools because of the tight integration. Um, yeah. But in certain cases where compliance requirements are there or, or other internal requirements where we have to use um, on-prem solutions or other vendors, you know, we 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 um we obviously have to deploy them, but really kind of the the going forward strategy is to to use as as much as possible native tools that AWS provides. Got it. Okay, so you talked about CloudTrail, CloudWatch, security groups, uh, and of course all the anything else that AWS provides would be something that you would seriously look at because that's it's built in and it's it's natively integrated, right? Right, so, right. great point. Uh, now, having gone through this in first initial deployment of your infrastructure on AWS, what are some of your lessons learned, the do's and don'ts, uh, and what would you, when you think about scaling that footprint, what are some of the things that you want to tell people that they should be watching for? Well, I think the most important piece is you have to have a plan before you're moving applications to the cloud, right? Um, and especially with infrastructures, code, roles, and responsibilities change. I mean, I think we speak up, we talk about this a little bit later, but you can you can set up whole infrastructure through through scripts. So um, the question then is: Is it still the networking team or the server team in charge of those sort of building those infrastructure, or is it maybe you know through DevOps the development team? So you have to think about roles and responsibilities. You should also have a clear understanding what you want to use the cloud for and how your future landscape is, should look like. One of the things that we experienced um, is, you know, we sh you should not try to mimic our existing infrastructure in the cloud, right? So we have, you know, a traditional three-tier approach, red, yellow, green. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong about those concepts, and the majority of them are still valid, but you should be open to kind of question those concepts and adjust them as they might not be the best way to set up your infrastructure in the cloud. Got it. Okay. So so basically get on the cloud, rethink how even the processes, right? Adopt what you can and change what you need to, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Be now, open to change. Yeah. So now let's let's talk about you talked about using native security controls in AWS. Why did you look at a tool like Dome 9? Right. What did Dome 9 provide? And uh, just just for the audience, Dome 9 is a security and compliance automation solution for it for uh, the public cloud. So we allow you to manage your infrastructure security on the cloud, manage uh, get complete visibility into your environment, and understand how you've configured security. So Roman, why did you look for a solution like Dome 9 in the first place? Sure. Um, so we quickly realized that we needed a tool for better visibility and control of our cloud infrastructure from a security and especially from a compliance point of view. Um, I mentioned this several times. Um, infrastructure is not code, and you can you can sort of set up whole environments in seconds using the AWS command line interface or scripts, right? And uh, we needed and it, Mistakes can happen, right? People stand up infrastructure, publish it to the internet, um, open on port 22 or 80, whatsoever. So we needed something that helps us to give us the visibility. Um, all the information we needed from a security point of view is, is, is available in the cloud, right? You can get this information, I don't know, about your three bucket settings or about open ports through the AWS console, through the command line interface, but you know it's not available in kind of a single pane of glass view out of the box. Mm -hmm. And for especially in our case, you know, working with command line interface from AWS, working with scripts, that requires knowledge that we didn't have at the time when we started moving applications to the cloud. So we needed something quickly in order to monitor what's going on. Um, 
So, we, so also the other thing is that we didn't have the resources to write our own script and collect all that information. So we decided to use DOM9 to help us enforce policy, right? So enforce things like region lockdown. We don't want something to be stood up in Ohio, right? So let's lock down the region. Um, we want to protect security groups against unauthorized changes. And most importantly, we want to get alerted upon high risk changes to the infrastructure if somebody publishes port 22 to the cloud or made some other kind of mistake that introduces an unnecessary risk to the organization. Got it. So visibility, monitoring to some extent, and also the active protection component, which is how do you make sure that you are able to lock down your environment, prevent people from going and uh, creating say security groups or instances in regions that you don't want to be in and so on, right? So that kind of active right. protection of your cloud environment from a, a security configuration perspective. Is that, is that, sure. does that sum it up? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So what does your security stack look like on AWS today? Because we, I know we talked about a little bit before. I just want to pick that up again. So what tools did you bring from your cloud, from your data center to the cloud? and what new tools have you adopted? And you don't have to name vendors, just what kinds of tools were you able to leverage in the cloud as well, and what did you have to come up with new solutions for? So I would say that our security stack in the cloud looks very similar to the one we have on-prem, right? I mean, we do use the same antivirus um, and intrusion prevention solution in the cloud that we have on-prem. You know, we use firewalls, we use security groups, we have key management, either from AWS or, for, or we manage the keys by our, by our own solution. Um, what kind of, what's interesting is that we had to kind of look at new tools um, like DOM9 that helped us with visibility and protection, but also things that are completely new to us, like we needed to, to look for, for a tool that helped us to bring security into cloud formation templates, for example, right? Scan those templates and, and, and find any vulnerabilities in there. And also, you know, kind of the concept of serverless architecture where, you know, ser uh, services are stood up, stood up and lived there for a couple of seconds and then are brought down that required new tools in the cloud to kind of be able to manage the same controls and, and, and um, level of security as we have on-prem. Got it, got it. So, so what you're saying is everything, if I understand right, everything above a certain line, which is, you know, OS and above, you're able to bring a lot of the tools that were in the data center into the cloud. But then between what the, the below the line and the shared responsibility model and the operating system layer, the, the software defined infrastructure layer, so to speak, right, which is security groups, visibility into all those security configurations. That's where you had to come up with something different because, again, that layer is not something that you manage distinctly in the data center, right? But then antivirus, yeah, right. encryption, key management, and so on, you have a lot of the same concepts in the data center that are equally applicable in the cloud. Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, Scott, similar question back at you. What are some of the uh, principles, tools, what aspects of data center security can be preserved in the public cloud and what needs to be rethought? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question because, you know, when you, when you talk about data center security in, in AWS, as, as you know, you don't get access to the data center anymore. You're really focused on the kind of that stuff that's, that's above there. Um, but, but when you think about data center security, you know, you, you were concerned with, you know, making sure, you know, who can access the data center, for, for example, and, and what they can do in the data center. And so a similar concept applies to AWS. So AWS is basically your, your you, know, you kind of look at it as your new data center, and there's lots of different services and things you can run uh, there in, in there. And so you're going to want to make sure that you're actually controlling access <clears throat> instead of into the data center, but to the actual services in your AWS account, saying what people can do what with which services in AWS and, and, and what things they can do against that service. Can they start instances? Can they stop them? Can they only address things that, that have a, a tag of test versus production? So uh, it's a different way of kind of looking at that, at that security as far as what people are doing in your new kind of cloud data center. Uh, you know, and you're also responsible for, you know, still, you know, controlling application access to the things that you're running on there and, and, and content. Uh, to that, you know, those are things you're probably doing in, in your in your data center today, or or, or as a company, uh, things that are really uh, kind of need to be rethought are one around how you're protecting your content. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, we talked about at the beginning of the uh, the, the webinar about you know you own your content, but 
customers, you know, being with their data being in the cloud and, and still kind of not having the, the ability to kind of walk up and hug that server that, that's hosting your, your content. There's there's different things that customers need to think about how they're going to protect their content. You know, there might be some new approaches to how they're encrypting or, 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 or storing that content. Um, there's also some, maybe some different compliance things. As, as Roman mentioned, you know, everybody has compliance requirements that they're probably dealing with in their data center today, but how they are going to uh, answer those compliance questions when they're running on the cloud is it's a different approach because once again they don't they don't focus on the, the bottom part of the infrastructure and there may be some different mapping as far as what compliance controls line up when it comes to the cloud uh, and, and finally you know there's <clears throat> a different approach about how you're going to actually track and respond to events that are happening in your cloud environment. I think one of the cool things is that you get this amazing level of access. The AWS platform puts out a tremendous amount of data uh, that you can you know can do something with, but it, but at scale it becomes a challenge. So kind of trying to figure out how am I going to track, uh, make sense of these uh, events, identify the ones that are most important, and actually take action on them. And that's where you know, potentially have an opportunity to automate how you actually take action on those things as well. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that you can't, you know, that are kind of similar today and, and things that, that, you know, maybe starting point of how you even need to rethink uh, how you're doing your security when it comes to AWS. Sure, absolutely. I think, I think uh, compliance is one of those topics that I definitely want to dig into a little more because I know that uh, Western Union being in the industry that it is, it is something that they, it's part of doing business uh, anywhere, right? In IT, is compliance, regulatory compliance. So we're going to dig into that a lot more. Uh, Scott, a final question for you in, in this, in, on this topic. You know, what are some of the tools that AWS provides from a security perspective that you think are essential in uh, a customer's toolkit when they're getting started in the cloud? Sure, sure. Um, so I would start with, you know, uh, they're not in order here, but a couple of ones that I would call out clearly are the, you know, the identity and access management, AWS IAM. That's the first thing you're going to interact with when you when you start an AWS account. It's controlling, managing uh, access for both users and non-users. If you have applications or, or things that need to access resources in your AWS account, it's through IAM that you're actually controlling that access. So uh, IAM is like one of those first things that you're going to want to be focusing on and paying attention to. It's a critical one. Uh, I'd also call out CloudTrail, which is in that compliance section. Is like CloudTrail tracks every API call that happens against your AWS account. You know, and, and we have customers, and, and potentially Roman is in that bucket, who use the output of CloudTrail to help verify compliance, to say, look, nobody was able to, nobody actually accessed uh, this particular storage location, or, or, or you know, they weren't able, the people that accessed it are the people that are in the list of people that accessed it. So, you know, so that's, that's like a, a super important part a, a, as well. And then, you know, you've got the things around there that, that often help our customers a lot. You know, you've got your networking, the virtual private cloud, which allows you to define your, your own kind of private network in the AWS space where customers can run their workloads and, and control them, but also link them up uh, with their corporate uh, data centers to kind of have that hybrid extended uh, type uh, approach, and then you've got just a lot of these other around the edge things that help customers kind of uh, implement the security they want, you know, especially if they're looking to take that native approach, uh, such as Roman's doing, so that they can implement additional above and beyond security things uh, while kind of relying on things that kind of interact natively with the AWS ecosystem, and then finding the partner part products that, that kind of leverage all of those tools as well. Wonderful. Wow. This is, this is really what sets AWS apart from a security perspective. It's just the richness of the tools and the kind of the maturity of the platform when it comes to thinking about security. It's just it's amazing, right? Uh, and we're already getting a lot of really good questions in. Uh, I want to save the questions till we've had the discussion so that, you know, we give people a chance to ask all their questions. But uh, you now the question window is available for everyone who's listening in. So if you have any additional questions, please ask them. Uh, Roman, compliance. I know that uh, Western Union has to think about compliance, both compliance and kind of internal governance. So what are some of the requirements for you and your team when you think about compliance and regulatory compliance? And what are some of the tools that you use to manage compliance in the cloud? So obviously, you know, PCI, SOC, SOC, those are big topics for us. Um, of course, there are other regulations. I mean, doing business in more than 200 countries or territories, you know, there are certain countries with specific requirements for data storage, encryption, um, tokenization, whatsoever. So, which we have to be compliant with, right? Which is which is a challenge. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, kind of we use Bomb9, for example, to to um, assess our environment against PCI. Um, and you know, from an internal IT governance requirements point of view, what we did, and you know, this is an AWS is more that's a new topic for us, and you know, we didn't really want it to reinvent the wheel when it comes to internal IT governance for for the AWS. So we looked there, and you know, there is the CIS benchmark for AWS available. And, and we basically built our IT governance rules around the CIS benchmark. Um, and you know that's another thing we do with Dom9 is we, we monitor our compliance against those CIS benchmarks. We kind of adopted it a little bit to meet our internal um, requirements. But we're using Dom9 to basically make sure that we are compliant with those benchmarks. Got it. Awesome. So compliance, of course, uh, you said you use the compliance engine. We're going to look at a demo of that. I want to. I want to kind of show show the product a little bit so that people understand what we provide from a compliance perspective. Uh, so let's kind of take a step back. Where are you going with your footprint on AWS? Like what's going to see, where do you see your environment going a year from now or three years from now? Um, well, obviously we're going to continue moving applications to the cloud. Um, what was clear from the beginning is, you know, that, you know, we're not going to be a, 100% cloud company, right? We're gonna still have applications running in on-prem data centers. That we really only want to move applications to the cloud where it makes sense, right? Um, so we're gonna grow in the cloud. Obviously, you know, we're gonna keep close to new technologies. Um, as you know, there is always new stuff that comes out that is available in the in the cloud. Um, from a security point of view, you know, the clear direction for the team is we have to focus on automation. Um, we have to get better in that, and we have to be ready to change um, and adapt DevOps models and infrastructures, code, serverless architecture, with kind of but without giving up core security principles. Got it. Got it. So Scott, I want to close with yes, a sir. question to you. So what are some some assets, things that people can read to learn more about securing their AWS environments? Sure, sure. So. Um, the cool thing here is there's a lot of public uh, assets that are out there for people. You don't have to even have an AWS account to, to start learning about this. And so if you just search on AWS security white papers or, or, or go to our security center, which is uh, aws.amazon.com slash security, you'll find our white papers as well. But uh, like the introduction to AWS security uh, is a great starting point. It, it will hammer home the, the shared responsibility model that I talked about again and kind of talk to you about our approach to, to security and, and how we kind of take uh, and fulfill our part uh, of the shared responsibility model. Uh, mm-hmm. There's an AWS security best practices white paper that kind of outlines the best ways for you guys as customers to be able to implement security on, on AWS. Uh, and even this, this handy AWS security checklist, which is obviously, uh, it's a starting point. It's gonna be a little bit different for every customer, but just like some some key items that you might wanna go through and, and look at uh, when it comes to, to security uh, on AWS to kind of just say, hey, how do we think we're doing? Do we think we've got the right things checked here and stuff? So so these are these are great starting points and certainly not the only things, but that, you know, if, if I was looking at a customer who was just trying to learn, uh, I would definitely recommend getting started with, the, with these particular uh, items. Awesome. And there are a lot of really good uh, discussion forums on, online as well. So in addition to these resources, there are meetups that people can go to that we I've been to in the Bay Area for sure uh, that I would recommend. It's a very good, strong community of people who are doing stuff and, and very good discussions around security, what people are doing. Uh, great place to look. So I just want to close with a very quick five-minute overview of what Dome 9 does. Uh, since we've talked about the Dome 9 tool and how Western Union is using it, uh, very quick overview of Dome 9, and both as a company and uh, the, the platform. So Dome 9 was launched in 2013. Uh, the company is headquartered in Mountain View here in sunny California uh, with R&D in Tel Aviv. We are around 65 employees split evenly between the U.S. and uh, Israel in Tel Aviv. Uh, and what we provide is a SaaS platform called Dome 9 Arc that allows you to manage security and compliance in public cloud environments, right? And AWS is, we are an AWS advanced technology partner with security competency. Uh, Over 250 customers at this point who are using Dome 9 as their security console for the public cloud for AWS. And they are essentially using the the automation capabilities and the orchestration features that Dome 9 provides. And these features are built on top of the native security controls, right? So you basically are still 
using the native controls that AWS provides, but then Dome 9 gives you essentially a force multiplier tool built on top of that, right? So it enhances that platform. Uh, and you know we constantly track what AWS is coming up with from a security perspective because for us that gives us a way to add to our capabilities and provide that to the customer. So uh, what we offer, you know, from from in terms of the problems that we solve, visibility and Roman talked about this a lot. Visibility across your accounts, across your regions, VPCs. What assets do I have? What level of exposure do these assets have to the external world? Right. A lot of we've seen a lot of instances where uh, purely because of operator error, we are seeing S3 buckets that are ex left exposed to the world. We are seeing EC2 instances or RDSs that are being left exposed to the world simply because of misconfigurations, completely avoidable errors, right? And so this is what Dome 9 gives you visibility into, allows you to prevent these things from happening by showing you what level of exposure these assets have to the uh, outside world. Uh, we also have the ability to go and scan your environment, see if there are any vulnerabilities at that software-defined infrastructure layer, and fix them in place, right? So remediation. Uh, and Roman talked about this a little bit. We have active protection capabilities. So we give you the ability to go and lock down your security configurations in your cloud environment so that, for example, people can go and create instances or security groups in regions where they're not supposed to, or you don't have people going and changing the security configurations outside of your control. And this is a real problem when you have, you know, API-based security configuration management, or you have, you know, people going directly to the console and trying to make some changes. Dome 9 allows you to find these and revert them so that these problems don't occur, okay? Um, and finally, compliance management. We give you a way to automate a lot of the assessment uh, and management and reporting of compliance in your public cloud environments. And we'll look at, look at the tool in a little more detail. So what are some of the use cases? When we look at our customers, we see two broad buckets, right? We see some customers who are just getting started on the cloud, want to make sure that they are following all the security best practices, they have dotted their I's, crossed their T's, and they are getting started securely on the cloud. And this is an area where Dome 9 gives you exactly the tools you need to make sure that you're following those security best practices and you can get onto the cloud with confidence. The second scenario is the scaling of security operations, right? So say you have 50 instances, you're going on 150 instances, right? You're, you're adding, you're scaling your environment. You want to make sure that your security operations are scaling with the size of your cloud environment, right? And this is where Dome 9 gives you the ability to go and look across your entire cloud footprint and apply security best practices, right? So it is an operational efficiency tool that allows you to scale your cloud security operations. Because as Scott, you and I were talking about, you know, security is something that you want to have always on and consistent, right? You want it to be consistent across your entire footprint. And the third thing that we see a lot of is you see this notion of security drift, right? So day one, you've got a very robust security posture. Over time, people make small changes. Someone goes and opens up port 22 in one of their security groups because they want to access some server inside. And day 50, all of a sudden, you have a lot of holes in your security posture. You see a lot of modifications, right? Detecting and preventing those security drifts from happening, something that Dome 9 helps with. And the other use case is DevSecOps. So how do you bring security into your DevOps processes with things like automated checking of your CFTs, cloud formation templates, from a compliance perspective. You can basically run the cloud formation template through our compliance engine before you deploy to the public cloud environment. Right? So DevSecOps is an area that we, in fact, have a lot of customers who have built their DevOps processes using the Dome 9 API uh, to, to invoke security capabilities. Uh, so what are some of the differentiation uh, factors of Dome 9? We are completely agentless and cloud native. right? So we use the AWS API to get any information we need from the AWS environment and to enforce those changes. And you don't have to install any agent. You're not installing any software because we are 100% SaaS. So you're up and running in practically five minutes, right? You get started on AWS, create a Dome 9 account, uh, and connect your AWS account to Dome 9 via cross-account access, right? And now you suddenly have complete visibility into your AWS environment. You know what assets you have, what level of protection they have, and so on, right? And we are completely focused on the public cloud, right? We don't have 
uh, a kind of hybrid. We are focused. We believe that the public cloud is here to stay, and the public cloud needs a new approach for security. So what we provide is 100% focused on the cloud. Very quickly, you know, broadly speaking, we have three buckets of functionality. We have network security, which is how do you look at all the different security groups, VPCs, security configurations, make sure that you have set things up correctly. We have the compliance and governance uh, component, which is our compliance engine, allows you to automate compliance processes. And then we have privileged identity protection, which is how do you provide a layer of protection on top of your identity and access management, what AWS provides, so that you are preventing uh, even hijacked accounts, like a hijacked admin account, from being able to go and do catastrophic things in your cloud environment. Right. So three broad areas, IAM protection, uh, compliance and governance, and network security. So with that, I want to do a very quick demo of the product because I think a lot of the questions that we have got are related to things that the, a demo will really clarify well. So let me see if I can uh, share my screen. And then just so everybody knows, uh, while Osuda's getting ready here, uh, as soon as we're done with the demo, we will dive into your questions that you're submitting. So please uh, uh, don't hesitate to, to submit your questions, and we'll get to those as well. Okay, so very quick demo, folks. So this is the home screen. When you log into Dome 9, this is the main screen that you see. Uh, the home screen of the Dome 9 Arc platform. You see all the protected assets across your cloud environments. You can see all the network policies at a glance, like what, how many security groups do I have and what kind of policies do I have in my environment, and also any alerts related to those policies. And then the compliance engine allows you to see at a glance what kind of compliance runs I have done recently and how much of the, the success is there in each of the environments. So this is PCI DSS in my AWS prod environment, and I see that uh, I've succeeded only 27% of the tests, which is not a good thing, right? So at a glance, you get to see all the different compliance runs that matter to you. So PCI DSS may be important for you, so you can put that on your home dashboard. And then IAM safety is that identity protection uh, capability that I talked about. Now, I want to highlight a couple of tools that are particularly uh, widely used in our platform. The first one is something called Clarity. So when you go here and click on Clarity and G beta. You basically get the screen. Okay, so here, Clarity is our visualization platform, right? It's our visualization tool. Allows you to look at all the different entities from a network security perspective. So here you see in the Oregon region, I have all these different VPCs, and this at a glance view tells you how the VPCs are connected to each other. So do you have peering relationships between VPCs? Uh, do you have any that have direct connect to some data center resource, right? So at a glance, you look at all the different VPCs in that region and how they are connected to each other. And then you can click on any single VPC. It tells you how many assets of different types you have in that environment. And then if, you, if I were to click into this and click security group view, I get this view, right? And this is practically within five minutes of getting started with the Dome 9 account, you get this visibility of your environment. Each of these boxes, is a security group in that VPC. The number here tells you the number of entities, assets. You know, it could be instances, it could be uh, RDSs, it could be anything. It tells you how many assets each of these security groups has. So very quickly, from left to right, you're seeing left is the left side external is all your external IP addresses outside of your cloud environment, and internal are all the security groups that are only talking to other internal security groups, right? So. Left to right, it tells you the level of exposure to the outside world. And the lines represent inbound and outbound policies, uh, security configurations that tell you which security groups can talk to which others, right? So at a glance, you're getting this micro-segmentation architecture in a Visio flow diagram that shows you how security groups are connected to each other. So for example, I would expect that in my DMZ, I have only the load balancer, right? Or, or maybe a firewall. But here I see that my default security group is sitting in the DMZ and it has one instance which is a database server, right? So now I have a database server which because it's part of the, DM, uh, of the uh, default security group is exposed to the outside world, right? And if you look at why that is happening, someone has left port 22 open on that default security group, right? So at a glance, Clarity is showing me not just how the different security groups are related to each other, 
but also kind of a visual diagnostic of, hey, something looks wrong here because I should not have anything sitting right next to the uh, load balancer in the DMZ. So now you're able to go and drill down and find those problems. The other thing that we provide is the ability to take your VPC flow log information and overlay that onto this diagram, right? So now, if you look at what we see here, sorry, my screen is not moving. Give me a second, guys. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the, there we go. It's moving. Let's come back to this. So here you look at each of the security groups. It's showing you an indicator, which is how much drop traffic there is to that VPC, right? And I can basically look at all my VPC flow logs in the context of these security groups, right? So what traffic do I have going in and out of different security groups in my VPC? Right, so this is a very natural, intuitive way to consume VPC flow log information, showing you what kind of drop traffic there is between security groups. Now, very quickly, the other tool that I want to highlight is the Compliance Engine. Compliance Engine is that automation framework that allows you to run standards like the CIS Foundations benchmark that Roman talked about, or the PCI DSS standard. So I can take the CIS benchmarks. I have all the tool, all the rules encoded here. Now I can run an assessment against an environment of my choosing. So I'll choose my AWS production environment and I will choose uh, say the Oregon region that we just looked at and run. And practically within a minute you're going to see the compliance results here. Right. So it's basically taken that rule set, pulled whatever information is required from that environment and run that rule set against that environment and it's giving you the results. Right. So now I have 51% pass, 48% fail. I can scroll down to look at what has failed and why, right? So I can expand on this. It tells me what, which part of the CIS benchmark this is and why it's failing. So at a glance, Clarity Compliance Engine, and this is the Dome 9 platform for you. So if you, we have, of course, a lot more functionality that we've not covered, but I want to get to the questions right now. Awesome. Got cool. Thank you so much, Suda. I appreciate it. Um, we are going to move on to our questions here. We have lots of questions. Uh, we'll get through as many as we can here. Uh, Roman, I'm actually going to start off with you. Uh, first question I have is, what kind of training did your team actually need to go through when moving from an on-premise to, to a public cloud environment? Um, well, the, there are two things, right? First thing is kind of AWS provides a pretty good security training, which is, I think, free which gives you a pretty good overview of, you know, the different concepts of security groups and network access control list, list cloud wash, cloud trail. So I would start with that. On the other side, on the DevOps side, that was a little bit more difficult for us to find uh, good training. Um, we have been working with a consulting company that helped us through the journey at the beginning that had experience on the DevOps side as well as on the AWS cloud security side. Okay, awesome. Good. Suda, for you, <clears throat> when we talk about um, Dome 9 and, and policy enforcement, uh, can you talk how, how that differs from maybe like a, a normal IAM API management policy? Uh, would you say that they're the same or, or different in functionality as far as what you're doing? Sure. So what we are providing is basically when you talk about policy enforcement, policy management, there are two aspects to it. One is we are getting all the information about your security configuration, security policies from your AWS environment, and then presenting that information to you in a way, in, in at least five different ways, right? So you're basically looking at the policies through your policy explorer that allows you to look at what you've set up and so on. Then we just looked at clarity that allows you to look at those same security configurations and policies from a completely different perspective, which is very visual, which is very intuitive for someone who's setting up that architecture, right? Because that Visio diagram that you saw, that, that diagram that you saw on the screen, is exactly what a lot of our customers were doing manually in their environment, something that took them days or weeks, right? So what we're giving you is the ability to look at that information in a lot of different ways and to make decisions based on that. Right, so now because you were able to see it, look at it as clarity, now you're able to say, oh, I see that there is this security group that is misconfigured, I can go and fix those configurations. So yes, of course, we use the API capabilities that are provided by AWS, right? We are not putting agents and doing 
overlay security models of any kind. What we're using are those native controls, but then we are giving this ability to look at it in a lot of different ways and to act on that information. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, another question for you, Suda, is kind of um, talking about the effort to, to start using Dome 9 and, and, and get up and running. Do you guys have any sort of like, a, I, I know you mentioned, you know, a few minutes in, in your demo, but any sort of my, a formal checklist or, or, or guidelines uh, for people to kind of help get them started on, on such efforts uh, around sure. Dome 9? That's a great question, and, and I think I would like to answer it, and then I love Roman to jump in and talk about his own experience. So, you know, it is, it, it honestly is a five-minute process. You're not installing any software. We offer a free trial on the website, so you can go on the website, sign up for a two-week free trial. Within five minutes, you just have to connect your AWS account using that IAM role to the Dome 9 account, and now, you know, we have two modes. We have what's called the read-only mode, where all we are doing is pulling information from your AWS environment and using that to show you information, right? So you look at it. If you find any problems, you have to go back to AWS console to fix it. And then we have what's called the full control mode where you get a lot of the more advanced active protection capabilities that Roman talked about. This process, we have onboarding guides. We have people who can help you get set up. So that, that of course, we've, we've helped all our customers get onboarded where needed. But the process itself is very streamlined. And it honestly takes, you know, five to ten minutes. Of course, if you want to get familiar, make sure that you've got everything set up. You know, within a day, we've had, you know, customers with dozens or tens of accounts get set up on uh, Dome 9. So, Roman, how was your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, like you explained, right, it's going to take five to ten minutes. If you have the, if you have the, the rights in the IAM console, right, in, in AWS console, you have the necessary IAM rights, you hook up Dome 9, and immediately you see um, the, the information um, replicated into Dome 9. Um, as you said, we started with monitoring mode, so we were sure, you know, we can't make anything wrong. Um, started in monitoring mode, started getting familiar, started running reports, and, you know, kind of, and then slowly shifted over from monitoring to a control mode. Awesome. Cool, cool. Um, one, one final question, which I think will probably take us uh, here. Uh, just a quick question. We'll, we'll need to be quick on this one, but talking about security controls that are implemented and how you're able to actually successfully audit all, all of these and, and stuff like that. And I'll maybe start it off real quick. As, as I mentioned, the shared responsibility model, AWS takes care uh, of the bottom part, and we work with third-party auditors to actually get that bottom part of that platform compliant uh, against the various compliance bodies, such as PCI and, and, and ISO. Uh, and if you actually go to the AWS console and search on compliance reports, we actually make those third-party attestations available to you. Uh, and, and then that's where you know, uh, uh, you know, a partner like uh, Ecto9 would come in with the, with the top part of that as far as giving you your compliance requirements uh, against uh, those particular things. But really quickly, Suda, anything you would add to that as far as uh, how you're implementing sure. that or any challenges? Yeah, so, so I'll also start with kind of the security off the platform. Dome 9 itself is SOC 2 Type 2 certified. Uh, we have the ISO 27001 attestation. So we take our own security very seriously, and so we go for making the platform as secure and those attestations are of course available and we are built on AWS which is, you know, we run on AWS ourselves which itself is a very secure platform. Now when it comes to uh, what we provide for security uh, auditing, right, AWS provides amazing tools for security auditing as well, right, which is, you know, the audit trail, the ability to look at what, what security changes you've made. Dome 9 provides an independent third-party audit trail as well, right, so we have auditing, logging, alerting built into the platform. So now you have two reference points. You can look at AWS and Dome 9 as, you know, just to be doubly sure you have audit auditing built into the, both the platforms that you can use, right? And it's always good to have independent audits, independent third-party audit as well as AWS so that you can be sure that, that nothing has been tampered with, there have been no changes that have been made that you don't know about. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suda. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to close things out today. I'd like to first thank uh, Roman and Suda for your participation today. It's been, it's been great having you guys here. I love the discussion. Uh, so thank you very much for your time.